Well, today we are in the seventh part of a series that I've entitled The Facts of Life. Facts of Life. And as we've spoken, a fact, the definition of that word has gotten kind of muddy in society today. You know, we have people uh, in the media talking about alternative facts. Uh, we have people talking about fake news, things like that. And so what is a fact? Well, the dictionary says that a fact is something that actually exists. It's reality. It's truth. A fact is something that is true for all people in all cultures, in all economic situations, all places, all times. That's a fact, okay? For example, the fact that we need to breathe or we're going to die, that is a fact. If you don't breathe, you're not going to live, okay? We all understand that that's a fact. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how much money you have, doesn't matter what position in society you have, you need to breathe. That's a fact. Then we have opinions. For example, coffee is better than tea. Now, that's my opinion, Okay? Now, not that I don't like tea. I love a nice cup of tea. Sometimes I'd rather have a tea, but coffee is my preferred beverage. Now, I know that there are other people out there who would disagree with me. They would much rather have tea than coffee. And there are others who just really don't want a hot beverage like that at all. You know, and those are opinions, and those, those differ from person to person, and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But today we're not talking about opinions in this series, we're talking about facts. And so far, we've spoken about six facts of life. We've talked about fact of life number one. There is a God. He's not you. Okay? It's not about you. It's not about you. Fact number two. Poo happens. Bad things are going to happen. That's just that's a fact of life. And, and maybe you didn't cause it. Maybe you did. Maybe you're just an innocent bystander. But the fact is, things are going to happen. Fact of life number three, God is not fair. You've heard me say that. If God were fair, either I'd be skinny, rich, and good looking, or the rest of you would be fat, broken, ugly, if God was fair. God's not fair, but God is good. God is good. Fact number four, today's the only day that matters. I can't do anything about yesterday. Yesterday's gone. Can't change it. Tomorrow's not here yet. The only day I can do anything about is today. Today is the only day that matters. Fact of life number five, change is hard. We know that. <laughs> change is very hard. Even things that we know we must change can sometimes be very difficult. Fact of life number six, which we talked about last night or last week, happiness is optional. Happiness is optional. God is more concerned about your character than he is your happiness. That's a fact. And those are the ones we've covered so far. If you've missed those, you can go online, uh, catch them on our church website, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can catch those messages there. If you're here today, you can head in the back and grab a CD. And if you're listening online and you'd rather have a CD, give the church a call. You can find our contact information on our website, and we'll, we'll mail you one. That's not a problem. Uh, but today, I'm going to head and go and yeah, yeah, I'll get it out. I'm going to go ahead and get into fact of life number seven, wrong is wrong. Wrong is wrong. Now, I know some of you might be going like, okay, that seems kind of redundant, Pastor Harry. It seems like maybe, you know, you're, you're saying the same thing. Or you might be thinking, well, duh, yeah, this is a very obvious statement. You don't, you don't need to say that. We all know that. But although it's true that it's probably redundant, and although it's true that we probably already know this, I think it's something that we need to look at in detail today. Now, why do I say that? I say that because for many of us, we may believe that this statement is true for other people, but not necessarily for us. We may think that it's true for others, but not necessarily for us. And I'm sure that you're a little confused maybe at that statement, so let me elaborate just a little bit, okay? Now, we all know that there is such a thing as absolute truth. There is right and there is wrong. Now, there's a lot of areas in life that are gray areas where it's not right or wrong. It's just different or it's contextual, situational, whatever. But there are things in life that are just, you know, it's, it's absolute. It's right or wrong. And as followers of Christ, we know that we need to shun the wrong and pursue the right. Scripture is full of admonitions to, leave a, to live a righteous life. 
We know this. This is not a surprise to any of us. But yet, we don't always apply this to our life. Well, sometimes we try and we fail, and that's where grace comes in. Sometimes we don't even try. Sometimes we know that we're doing wrong, and we would judge other people for the same thing, but not ourselves. See, here's one of the issues that I see with judging people and judging versus judging ourselves. We tend to judge others on their actions while we judge ourselves on our motives. We tend to judge others on their actions, what they do, while we judge ourselves on our motives. While I didn't mean to hurt their feelings, you know, I, I didn't mean for it to, to happen that way. I didn't intend for, for this to take place, so I'm okay. It's all good. But for other people, their motives don't always matter, do they? We judge them on their actions. And if God were to communicate to you specific instructions on something, would you follow them? Now, of course, the Christian answer is to say, well, yes, of course, Harry. Me and my holy self, as righteous as I am, of course, I would follow whatever it is that God instructed me to do. Absolutely. And I think for the most part, we probably would. Most of us would, would try at least, okay? But I also know that it would not be consistently true for all of us all the time. Now, I want to give you a great example from the pages of Scripture that illustrates my point. And this is a story that all of you should be familiar with. Um, you know, if you've hung around the church at all, you probably know this story. Uh, and uh, we find it in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. So Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, I'm going to start at verse 25. It says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Interesting encounter. We had an expert in the law, meaning this dude knew the Hebrew scriptures. Like he was an expert, knew it inside and out. Uh, it could be very easily believed that this man had the entire Hebrew scriptures memorized. Okay? Uh, you know, it was very expensive to, uh, to have a book in those days, and a copy of the entire Hebrew scriptures would have been an immensely expensive. Uh, thing to purchase. So many scholars, many experts, many teachers would actually memorize the Hebrew scriptures. And, and this man being an expert in the law would have had large portions, if not the entirety of at least the Torah memorized. Okay, so he knew the scripture. And it says that he wanted to test Jesus. He wanted to see if Jesus was as smart as everybody said that he was. So he goes up to Jesus. He says, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question, isn't it? It's one that a lot of us might ask. Hey, what do I got? I mean, eternal life, I'd like that. <laughs> what do I got to do to get it? Okay? And then Jesus turned it right back around to him and said, well, you're the expert in the law. You tell me. What do you think? Well, the expert in the law said this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, these are direct references to Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. That's where the expert in the law got those scriptures from. He said, these are the two greatest commandments. Jesus said to him, yep, yep, you got it right. It's the greatest commandments right here. By the way, in other places in scripture, Jesus says that the entire law and the prophets, meaning all of Scripture is summed up in these two commands. If you want the central message of the Bible, this is it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. In fact, later on, Jesus even boils it down to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The Apostle Paul said the same thing. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That sums up the entire law. And so Jesus said, okay, you're, you're right. But then this man 
ask Jesus another question. And this is the key to the story. Verse 29, this expert in the law said this. It says, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? It says that he wanted to justify himself. In other words, he knew what the commandment said. Love God, love your neighbor. He knew that. He was an expert. That was an easy answer for him. Yet he also knew that he fell short. But he didn't want to admit that he was falling short. So he's trying to justify himself. Well, who's my neighbor, Jesus? It's a very good question, isn't it? When it says, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself, who is our neighbor? I mean, is it the person that lives next to me on either side of me? You know, people that live right close to me? Is it them? Is it people that live, you know, in my town, in, in my, my region? Who is it? Well, as we look through this, as we put this in context, our neighbor is whoever we're with. doesn't matter where they're from. doesn't matter if it's the person next door. doesn't matter if it's somebody from 10,000 miles away. If, if I am near them, they are my neighbor. And I am called by God to love them as I love myself. And this is where it can get a little difficult for some people. Because some people are really easy to love. Oh, man, we, we know people like that. You, you, you meet them, and within like five minutes, like you're like, man, I really like this person. You know, we all know people that are just very, very, very easy to love. Very easy to love. You know, and I'm just bragging on my wife a little bit. She's one of those people. Those of you who know my wife, you know that. She's incredibly easy to love. Although I did have somebody come to me one time and said, your wife kind of scares me, Harry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come on. I said, she doesn't scare me. She probably ought to, <laughs> but she doesn't, you know. Uh, and the, the thing is, Brenda doesn't put up with malarkey is, is the thing. You know, you, you, you try to throw some malarkey her way, she's going to call you on it. And some people don't like that. You, you know what I mean? But, you know, very easy person to love. People are like that. But then there's those who aren't so easy to love. And we all know people like that, too. And please don't be naming any names or poking your neighbor. Okay? There are people that are really hard to love. And there are some that it seems downright impossible to love, doesn't it? It's just, that's reality. A few years ago, I read a book by Jimmy Spencer Jr. called Love Without Agenda. If you're looking for a, a good book to read, I highly recommend reading this book. It's, a, it's a, not a long book, but it's a very good one, Love Without Agenda. And in the book, uh, Jimmy Spencer deals with this subject in an interesting way. He, he says that we can easily love those who are just like us. If somebody is just like me, meaning they dress like me, they act like me, they think like me, they believe like me, they have the same interests as I do, you know, they're very easy to like and to love. I remember a few years ago, I was at a, uh, a pastor's gathering, and of course, you know, we live in a cell phone age, we carry our phones with us all the time, and those of you who know me know that I'm a nerd. I love science fiction, specifically Star Trek and Star Wars. They're both cool. Star Trek is my preference. I love Star Wars too, but I'm a big Trekkie. And at the time, my text alert on my phone, like when I got a text message, was the uh, communicator chirp from Star Trek. Okay? And so I'm at breakfast in this, in this big room, and, and I'm getting ready to, uh, to, to get my breakfast, and my text alert goes off. Somebody had sent me a text, and that Star Trek communicator chirp goes off. Well, this guy, Prairie Dogs, he like suddenly sticks his head up. That's a Star Trek original series communicator alert. Who was that? And I looked over and, and we became instant friends. He was a preacher. He was a Trekkie. He loved motorcycles. We were instant friends. You know, in fact, we still, I mean, we don't talk all the time, but we still text each other every now and then. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, we did a walk through the Old Testament. If anybody was here for the walk through the Old Testament, the guy I'm talking about is TJ, the guy that led the walk through the Old Testament that we had here. Um, lives in, uh, in Delaware. But uh, anyway, very easy to like, very easy to love. He was just like me. But then, then we get those people that aren't like us. They don't dress like us. 
They don't act anything like us. They don't think like us or believe like us. It's much harder to accept these people and love them, isn't it? In fact, depending on how different they are, sometimes, again, it may seem impossible. And the problem is that all of us see our way as the right way. Well, obviously this is the right way because this is the way I think. This is the way I act. This, this, is, this is what it is. And anybody that thinks differently from us, it's obviously wrong. Because you don't believe like I believe. And you've heard me say this many times, and it's a truth that all of us know intellectually. Nobody has a perfect belief system. We know this. None of us are 100% right in all of our beliefs. We're wrong somewhere. And there's nothing wrong with having your own belief system, but to think that you or any group that you belong to has a corner on the truth is just simply wrong. It's just wrong. All truth is God's truth. And just because somebody might not be part of our denomination or, or whatever doesn't necessarily mean that we're right and they're wrong. And I see this happen within Christian circles all the time, doing exactly what the expert in the law was doing with Jesus. Well, what do you think about this issue? What's your opinion on this? It's kind of a litmus test of, you know, how do you believe on this particular issue? Many times they're fringe issues. Not always, but many times they're, they're fringe issues. Who did you vote for? You know, one of those things. Who cares? I don't care who you voted for or even if you voted. It doesn't matter to me. It's irrelevant as far as things of faith are concerned. But yet we can make it an issue. We, we really can. Jesus called people like this hypocrites. And there was no shortage of them in Israel at, at, during Jesus' time, and there's no shortage of them today. And I'm going to go so far as to say that many within the church are a lot like this expert in the law. Like the idea of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength is great. We love that. We can, we can easily buy that. But we have a huge problem with loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. This man asked Jesus, trying to justify himself, who's my neighbor? And I love Jesus' answer on what he means by neighbor. Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now we know this whole story as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is a parable that would have shook the Jewish people listening to Jesus to the core. Like this would have been a radical, disturbing, on the edge kind of parable. Why? Because the hero in the story is a Samaritan. And we've talked about this before, but the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a, what they would call a mixed race. They were part Jewish, part Gentile. Therefore, they were not pure Jew. You know, it's a very racist statement, and they were very racist people. It's just the way it is. And they would look down upon the Samaritans big time. Even though the Samaritans worshipped the same God, they had the same scriptures. So their faith was the same. But because they weren't pure Jews, the Jewish people looked down on them. They thought it was impossible for a Samaritan to even have a right relationship with God. It was to the point that they would go miles out of their way to avoid Samaria. If the shortest way was to cut through Samaria and to go around would, would add a day or so to your journey, they, they'd add the day. They, didn't, they wouldn't go through Samaria. If a Samaritan was nearby, they would completely ignore them. 
would not even acknowledge their presence, would not speak with them, nothing. That was normal. I'm not saying it was right. That's what they did. Okay? And so in this story, we have three people. We have the man being attacked, robbed, and severely beaten. He was left for dead along the side of the road. And although it's not specifically stated, it's directly implied that this man is Jewish. Okay? So this, you know, Jewish man was beaten by robbers, stripped. They took everything, beat him nearly to death, left him to die along the side of the road. And as he's laying there, two men walk by. First man was a priest. The priest was one of the religious leaders of the day. One of his primary responsibilities was serving in the temple and teaching people the law. That was his primary responsibility. He would have been 100% aware of the command to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Would have been fully aware of that command. So why in the world did he go to the other side of the road, didn't even want to walk near him, went to the other side of the road and walked by? Why would he do that? Scripture doesn't tell us, but there's some very easy speculations that we can make. One is that he didn't want to be unclean. Priests were very concerned about being clean, not being unclean. If somebody was ceremonially unclean, uh, they had certain things that they had to go through. Being unclean meant you could not participate in religious ceremonies. You could not be around any other people. Anybody you touched would be unclean. In some instances, you had to actually go outside the camp and be in quarantine for a little while. And touching a dead body makes you unclean. And so it could have been a religious thing. It's like, oh, gee, I don't know if that guy is alive or not. I, but, but if I touch him and he's dead, that means I'm unclean. And, and I don't want to be unclean because, like, dude, that's a hassle. I'm a priest. I can't be unclean. So maybe it was the fear of being unclean. Maybe he had some duties to perform as he was walking by. Maybe he had some priestly duties. And, of course, if you're unclean, you can't perform your duties. Well, if I, if I touch this guy and I, if I get unclean, well, then I can't do what God has called me to do in the, in the temple or here or there. My, I can't do my religious duties if I do this. It's also possible that he was in a hurry, whether he needed to be or not. Like, you know, how many times are we in a hurry when we really don't need to be in a hurry? You know, we get caught behind Methuselah on the road, you know, so the, the guy that's driving like, 30 and a 65 and you can't get around him and we're not on a timetable we have plenty of time to get where we need to get but we get annoyed you know so we don't need to be in a hurry but we are maybe this guy was in a hurry i just yeah i'd love to help him but man i'm man i got this thing and uh, yeah i just i need to get where i'm going somebody else will take care of him he kept on going he didn't want to be bothered Probably could have been thinking, oh, the guy's either dead or close to dead anyway, so why should I even trouble myself? I mean, he's close to dead. But to quote Miracle Max from The Princess Bride, there's a big difference between being mostly dead and all dead. There's a big difference between being mostly dead and all dead. So after the priest walks by, it says a Levite comes along. He wasn't a priest but he was a fellow Jew, a fellow countryman, and would have also been fully aware of the command to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yet for whatever reason, he walked by too. And I have no doubt that his excuses were just as lame as the excuses of the priest. Now this traveling man in our parable here finally did get some help, and it was from a Samaritan. So when Jesus was telling this parable and he said, a priest went by and ignored him, and a Levite went by and ignored him. The people said, oh, that's, that's, that's terrible. They shouldn't have done that. But he said, but then a Samaritan stopped and helped. There would have been a huge intake of breath. <gasps> a Samaritan? And they probably would have said that with, like, hate in their voice. The Samaritan stopped and helped. And under normal circumstances, these two men would completely ignore each other, may even ca cast hateful glances at each other. And if they said anything to each other, it probably wouldn't have been very nice. But the Samaritan saw the need, and he stopped and helped. He took a break from his own agenda, used his own supplies, 
and even paid for the man's expenses. Why? Because he knew the scriptures. And he knew that it said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I don't know about you, but if I was robbed and stripped and beaten mostly to death and left for dead along the side of the road, I'd want somebody to stop and help me. You know, wouldn't you? We should stop. Jesus is saying to the expert in the law, the Samaritan, the one you hate, the one you despise, was more of a neighbor to that man than his fellow countrymen. That rocked people. Really did. Jesus is telling us to do the same. He's telling us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And, and you might be thinking, what does this have to do with our fact of life for today? Well, our fact of life, as we said, is wrong is wrong. And the priest and the Levite were fully aware of what God commanded. And in this situation, it meant helping the traveler that was left for dead. And, and they knew that leaving him for dead was wrong, but they did it anyway. And when we do things that we know are wrong or do not do things that we know are right, we tend to make all kinds of excuses to justify our actions, don't we? Like, I know I shouldn't do this, but I did it anyway, and I'm going to make excuses why I did it. Or, you know, I know I'm supposed to do this, but I'm not going to, and I'll make all kinds of excuses as to why I didn't do the thing that I'm supposed to do. Sometimes this excuse-making is very conscious, like it's a decision we, that we make to do this. Sometimes it's very subconscious, but whether it's conscious or subconscious doesn't matter because excuses are never a good thing. And here's the major issue with excuses and the major point in my message today. If I'm making an excuse for my actions, that means I don't think I've done anything wrong. And if I don't think I've done anything wrong, I can't repent. And if I can't repent, I'm in a world of hurt. Let me give you an example. I've heard people say this many times. Well, I know I shouldn't have said that to them, but, but they said this to me, and so that's why I said it. Or I just got mad, and, and it was because I was mad that I did that. Like, yeah, that might have been wrong, but this is why I did it. They're making excuses for their actions. I was doing marriage counseling one time with a couple, and a couple had some issues. The, the, the husband had serious anger issues, and uh, the wife had serious denial issues. And, you know, they both had, you know, big issues. And the, the glaring issue was his anger. Like, when he got mad, he got mean. You know, he didn't get physically mean, but he just, he was mean. And I started finding out a lot more about situations and found out that his wife used to, like, goad him. She would purposefully do things that she knew would upset him. And I'm like, well, why are you doing that? Well, it's because he did this. But stop doing it. Well, I wouldn't have done it if he hadn't have done this. And I'm like, okay. Now, I get nobody wants to get in trouble with a bear. If you don't want the bear to growl, don't poke him with a stick. If you poke the bear with a stick and he growls at you, don't be surprised. Again, I'm not saying it's right, but don't be surprised. Rather than making excuses, well, I'm okay because they're the ones that made me do this. No. No. They didn't make you do anything. I don't have any control over what other people do to me. I don't. I mean, sometimes I can affect certain things. But for the most part, I don't really have any control over what somebody does to me. I do, however, have 100% control over how I react and respond to what other people do to me. And if they do something bad to me and I respond with something bad... We've both sinned. I cannot justify my beha bad behavior based on their bad behavior. That's an excuse. Wrong is wrong. I need to own my junk and say, you're right, I, I shouldn't have done that. And just leave, and not do the, but they, no, no, no. I was wrong. Leave it there. And if they decide to repent, 
they decide to talk about what they did. Now you can continue the conversation a little bit if you want to. But I need to own my junk. If I don't, if I'm making an excuse, I don't think I've done anything wrong. If I don't think I've done anything wrong, I cannot repent. And if I can't repent, I'm in a world of trouble. You ever know somebody who refuses to admit that they're wrong even when it's obvious that they are? How pleasant are they to be around? Not at all. No. Now, see, there's a difference between sitting down and having conversation with somebody that you disagree with. Okay? You know, I love sitting down and having constructive debate with people. I love doing that. Uh, that's, you know, we, we learn that way. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it, it helps me reinforce my position. Sometimes it opens my eyes to like, wow, well, maybe, maybe their position is a better one to have. You know, it can be a lot of fun when it's productive. But I've had conversations with people that just could not even remotely admit that they might be wrong. They are not fun people to be around. Just because somebody else is doing something wrong doesn't mean I'm justified in doing something wrong. Just because I have a plan or agenda doesn't mean that God is not intending something different. Like this priest and this Levite, they probably had a plan. They probably had an agenda. The priest might have been saying, you know, I've I've got a 6 o'clock prayer meeting that I need to lead. lead, And if I stop and help this guy, I'm going to be late. God wouldn't want me to be late to prayer meeting, would he? We can justify it real easy, can't we? Very easily justify it. Think about it for a moment. What would please God more? Helping somebody that's been beaten, robbed, and is near death? Or getting to your appointment on time? Even if you're late, any decent person would understand. Sorry I'm late. You know, I passed a car accident, and I stopped to, to see what I could do to help. You know what I mean? I, I waited until the ambulance got there, and, and I had to give my statement to the police, and, and that's why I'm late. I'm sorry. And again, any decent person would totally understand that. And anybody that doesn't understand it, it's not someone that's worth spending time on anyway. Just not. I cannot begin to tell you how many Christians I've spoken with over the years that are blatantly disobeying God's instructions to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Blatantly disobeying that and making all kinds of excuses. All kinds of excuses. Oh, but Harry, they, they're an illegal immigrant. Who cares? If they have a need, help them. Well, but, but Harry, they're a liberal. Who cares? Who cares? But, but, but Pastor Harry, they're a, insert whatever race that's different than yours that you want to insert. That's when I resist the urge to reach out and lay hands on them and tell them, who cares? Who cares? But, but you know, they're probably an addict, and if I give them that money, they just might use it on drugs. Again, if God is calling you to help that person, what they use that money on is not up to you. I'm not saying enable bad behavior. It's not what I'm saying. But if I see somebody has a genuine need, and I feel the Holy Spirit tapping me on the shoulder and saying, help them, then I'm going to help them. And what they do in response to that help is, is not my responsibility. You follow what I'm saying? God is asking us to help people, especially when he points specifically. Because, I mean, if I were to help everybody who asks me, uh, I couldn't. You know, this world is full of needs. We have so many needs, even right here in our immediate community, that there's no way we can help everybody, but we can help some people. Reminds me of the father and the son that were walking down the beach one day, and the son looked down, and he saw the starfish in the sand. There was hundreds of them before him like looked up and there's all these starfish on the sand in the sun and he reached down and he picked up one of the starfish and he threw it back into the ocean and the dad said son you're not going to save all of them he's like save that one right i might not be able to save all of them but i'm going to help the ones that god puts in front of me 
I'm going to help the ones where God taps me on the shoulder and says, help them. I've had other times where God said, no, somebody else will take care of this person. But it's God that's directing me. Okay? We know that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but yet so many aren't doing it, and they even do what the expert in the law did. Oh, I'm supposed to love them? Well, what does love mean? Or some might even think that they are loving them. I am loving them. This is tough love. You know, and what, sometimes tough love is exactly what somebody needs. But sometimes we use the phrase tough love as an excuse to be a jerk. We do. We just do. What is love? Well, I can answer that question very easily. Go right to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. tells us what love looks like. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's what love is. And I'm called to love other people. My love to them should look like this. And sometimes it's really hard. Especially when I see certain celebrities specifically political figures on TV that I really don't like and they get caught in some kind of scandal, it's really easy to delight in evil rather than genuinely pray for them to experience God, to repent, to get right with Jesus, to turn their life around. That's the loving thing to do. You know? And way too often we feel that if we have a good excuse, we don't have to be concerned about it, but as followers of Christ, we need to stop making excuses and start doing what God asks of us. And I know some people might say, but, but Pastor Harry, you don't understand my circumstances. And, and you're right, I might not. I might not understand your circumstances. But bad circumstances are no excuse for bad behavior. I'm going to say that again. Bad circumstances are no excuse for bad behavior. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm all about grace all about grace, all about believing that people can change. But at the same time, let's just stop making excuses. Let's just admit that we're wrong and turn back to God. See, and the good news is if we admit that we're wrong and we repent, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I admit my junk, if I own my junk, God will forgive me no matter what it is. Repentance at me means admitting that we're wrong with no excuses attached. Wrong is wrong. Let's ingrain that into our mind. Even though it's hard to admit where we're wrong, especially when we've messed up big time, Let's own it, and let's not make excuses. Let's pray.